Hello and welcome to this webinar on a rationale for including disabled children in their local school. This is part two of the Knowledge Box on Disabled Children's Rights in Education, developed by CSIE for the IMAS2 project, Improving Assistance in Inclusive Educational Settings. Part one covered disabled children's legal right to inclusion. It invited you to make some notes, which we will revisit here. Part three will describe specific approaches and strategies which support inclusion for all. And part four is on roles and responsibilities of learning and support assistance in ordinary schools. My name is Artemis Akelariadis. I head up CSIE and we will go through this webinar together over the next half an hour or so. So first, let us consider, do we need a rationale at all? Do we have to explain why disabled children should go to their local school? This is what the law says, so shouldn't it simply happen in practice? In most people's experience, this is not that simple and it does not always happen. In this webinar, we will explore why educational practice is out of sync with educational law and outline why we believe this has to change. The question of whether schools should transform so that disabled children can be consistently included in their local school continues to spark debate. So, before we go any further, I would like to ask you, where do you stand? Please refer to your notes from part one of this knowledge box, where you recorded what you think children with unusual bodies or minds should be entitled to in education. We shall now take this one step further and consider what kind of setting seems best for realizing this entitlement. With the best interests of disabled children in mind, please write down what you see as the main advantages of mainstream and what of separate special schools. I shall now pause to let you make these notes. Thank you. Please hold on to these notes. We will revisit them at the end of this webinar. So let us turn our attention to how education law is put into practice. By exploring what happens in practice, we're effectively exploring every personal and professional decision made on the matter. Every educator plays a role in this. Anything and everything that happens for disabled children's education shapes how education law is put into practice. We have already seen that national and international laws state that all children should be included in their local school and that schools should transform to make this possible. If we were to explore how each country approaches this call for change, we would probably find that there is a lot more that national and local governments can do to help develop more inclusive schools. But this knowledge box is not for those who write laws or policies, it is for those who support children in schools. So what about everyday decisions of educators with regard to inclusion? Many understand the need to transform education and work hard to develop more inclusive schools. Others reject the requirement for including all children in their local school because they find it unrealistic, impractical, or unnecessary. Disregarding a government requirement is not unheard of. During the COVID-19 crisis, many governments introduced a requirement for everyone to wear a face mask in public places in order to protect themselves and others around them. Many people ignored this requirement, rejecting it as unrealistic, impractical or unnecessary. So how does such an attitude play itself out in education? When it comes to selecting a school for a child, here is a typical example of what may happen. This example comes from England, but the tendency to maintain the status quo is apparent in many countries. Parents are invited to express a preference for which school their child will go to. 
many parents make a formal request for their disabled child to go to their local school with any siblings they may have and with friends or potential friends from the local community. At this point, an admissions officer, or sometimes a multidisciplinary panel of professionals, consider all the information available and suggest which school the child should go to. The school in question may be asked if they can include this child. Typically, school leaders consider whether the child can fit into the school as they know it and often conclude that they cannot. The question could arise at this point whether to turn this child away or whether any changes can be made within the school to enable this child to be included. As you may remember from part one of this knowledge box, this is what should happen. A school is legally obliged to consider what reasonable adjustments it can make in order to include a disabled child. In practice, however, Questions about reasonable adjustments rarely get asked, and many schools simply turn disabled children away. In the eyes of the law, the denial of reasonable adjustments amounts to discrimination on the basis of disability. So this practice is in conflict with what the law says, but it keeps happening, possibly because it has been happening for a very long time and it rarely gets challenged. It seems to me that schools often resist developing more inclusive provision on the grounds that this has not been developed before. In other words, everyday decisions of educators end up sustaining a particular way of thinking about schools, which was first established a long time ago in a vastly different social context. In the resources section of this knowledge box, you will find an animated video called Special Education Revisited, which describes how education in England has changed over time. It shows that the idea of mainstream schools for some and separate special schools for others was never consciously or deliberately designed by educators or policymakers. It simply evolved out of other decisions being made in the context of their time. The idea that every child should go to school was established more than a hundred years ago when disabled people were thought to have no place in mainstream society. Schools were initially designed for the majority of children without anybody thinking that disabled children should go to school too. Later, as disabled children's need for education was gradually acknowledged, separate schools were set up for children who were blind or deaf in the first instance. By now, our social values have changed and disability equality is far better understood and accepted in society. Education, however, in many countries continues to operate on the dual system of mainstream for most children and separate special schools for those who are thought not to fit in to mainstream schools as we know them. In some places, educators and policymakers have agreed that after reasonable success with other aspects of equality, such as gender and race equality, the obvious next step in education is to work towards disability equality. In Canada, the Avon Maitland District School Board in Ontario has made a short video documenting its commitment to disability equality. You can find this in the resources section of this knowledge box. In this video, the Minister of Education for Ontario is quoted as saying, inclusion is not bringing people into what already exists. It is making a new space, a better space for everyone. So it seems that there are at least two ways of understanding the call for developing more inclusive education for disabled children. Some educators, understand children's rights as these are explained in international human rights instruments. They have embraced the call to transform education and take steps to change cultures and practices in their schools. Other educators have not made the connection with human rights or have alternative ideas about what children's rights are and do not see any reason why things should change. We all sometimes do things in the way we have always done them without pausing to think why things are done in this way. 
My favorite example is that of a safety demonstration before an airplane takes off. Years ago, safety demonstrations were made by members of the cabin crew standing in the aisle and physically showing how to put on a life jacket, how to inflate it, and how to use the light or whistle to attract attention. It would have been highly impractical to actually inflate a life jacket every time. So what happened was that the person simply pretended to pull the string to inflate the jacket, then just pointed to the tube for topping up with air if needed. More recently, it has become possible for safety demonstrations to be shown on video. Now, if you think about it, technology affords us an opportunity to do this differently by filming someone actually inflating the life jacket and blowing in the tube to, to, to top up the air. I have been amazed at how many airlines have missed this opportunity and simply filmed someone performing the safety demonstration as this had always been done in the way which had been established in a different context. In my mind, this is very similar to what is happening in education right now. Many countries still have the dual system of mainstream and special schools, which was founded upon social values of the 19th century. Looking at this dual system through the lens of disability equality today is likely to paint a picture of institutional discrimination against disabled people. This is not just about social and educational opportunities available to disabled children in one or another type of setting. Much more than this, it is about long-term consequences of a school placement and its impact on life chances. Children who go to school in the margins of an educational system are more likely to live adult lives in the margins of society. And as those who have embraced the social model of disability will know, the barrier to participation is not a person's impairment. It is society's failure to adjust to people's impairments effectively. Let me say a bit more on this for those who have not yet come across the social model of disability. Some people have one or more impairments, long-term loss of physical or mental functions. A conventional way of understanding disability is the belief that people become disabled by their impairments, physical, sensory, or mental impairments. An alternative perspective is to understand that impairments are part of human diversity and that some people become disabled by society, by the way many services and institutions are inaccessible to people who have physical, sensory, or mental impairments. This has become known as the social model of disability. The belief that people become disabled when society fails to make adjustments in response to people's impairments. It is important not to confuse impairment with disability. Impairment is the actual condition, while a disability is the barrier in the environment which places a person with an impairment at a disadvantage. This is not a matter of abstract theoretical perspectives. The way we understand disability shapes our understanding of disabled children's rights, and their needs, all of which has an impact on how education is organized. I suggest, therefore, that inclusion for all is a fundamental human rights question to which education has not yet found an appropriate answer. And so we are left in a vicious circle where the need for change is not widely understood and the laws which call for change are not strictly enforced. This leaves us with an ongoing anomaly in the system where education practice remains in conflict with education laws, but nobody seems to mind because things have been happening in this way for a very long time. This concludes our exploration of why educational practice is out of sync with education law. We now move on to explore why this has to change. The most important reason is that we are all of equal value by virtue of being human. People do not always treat one another equitably, however, because our perceptions of other people and our behavior towards them are often subject to unconscious bias. In other words, many of us carry preconceived ideas 
which shape our actions without being aware that this is happening. Some assumptions are so widespread and so deeply ingrained that they have become social stereotypes. Unfounded beliefs that disabled people are somehow substandard or not as worthy or cannot make a valuable contribution to society compared to non-disabled people are examples of such social stereotypes. In everyday situations and in one-off events, we are all constantly making small and large decisions about whom to approach, whom to greet, whom to talk to, whom to spend more time with, or whom to ignore or avoid. We all know that we should not judge a book by its cover, yet disabled people often say that they feel invisible as they are frequently ignored or avoided. Most of us have more in common with each other than differences, but some differences are so visible that sometimes people don't look beyond them and do not notice the similarities. Let us not forget that we can all do some things well and need help with others. And none of us like to be defined by what we cannot do. In other forms of life, diversity is not seen in such a negative way. Animals exist in all shapes and sizes, and they are all accepted without any suggestion that differences, that difference, sorry, creates a hierarchy of identities. Similarly, plants may grow in unexpected ways, and their differences are simply accepted without any prejudice. Differences are noted and not judged. Animals or plants which are different from most others are accepted and not pitied, overlooked or rejected. So it should be with people. Children who have unusual bodies or minds should be simply accepted as different, not pitied, overlooked or rejected as substandard. We are all different and should all be valued for who we are. As Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is a failure. In the resources section of this knowledge box, you will find a video called The Eyes of a Child and another called Things People with Down Syndrome Are Tired of Hearing. Take a look when you can to get a flavor of the discomfort many adults feel around disabled people and some widely held misconceptions Ask yourself if you ever had such thoughts, and if yes, try to work out where they came from. So how does all this relate to what happens in education? There seems to be a widespread belief that inclusion is all right for some, but there will always be children for whom it cannot work. This is not so. All means all. Any suggestion that inclusion for all is not possible is bound to refer to schools in their current state. In many places, schools have transformed and have successfully included children with any type or severity of impairment. The question is not so much what kind of environment can a child cope with at this point in time, but what kind of education will enable them to thrive in adult life after school. We suggest that the fundamental aim of education is to help all children develop relationships, sorry, develop relationships and prepare them for life in mainstream society. Recent research suggests that the benefit of including disabled children in ordinary schools is twofold. In the resources section of this knowledge box, you will find a summary of the evidence on inclusive education. It confirms that including disabled children in ordinary schools leads to improved educational outcomes for disabled as well as non-disabled children. It also confirms that inclusive education better supports the social and emotional development of all children, disabled as well as non-disabled. Another common reservation to including disabled children in ordinary schools is that of capacity. Mainstream schools, this argument goes, 
do not have capacity to respond to the needs of all children. So the assumption is that they cannot. In response to this, we suggest that an effective alternative is to harness existing expertise in the first instance and establish systems of support for staff in ordinary schools so that supporting disabled children's learning and development becomes a collective and collaborative venture with no expectation that all staff need to become experts in responding to any and all kinds of impairments. In this way, any financial concern would also be addressed that it is more cost effective for specialist staff to travel between schools than it is for children to be on school transport. In England, millions of pounds are spent each year to transport disabled children long distances twice a day, often by taxi with a paid escort, in order to educate them away from their non-disabled peers. This makes neither financial nor social or educational sense. The final reason why there is often resistance to including disabled children in the local school is the argument that this would take up too much of teachers' time. While this is an accurate prediction, everything teachers do takes up some of their time and planning for a disabled child's learning does take time. It is important to recognize an implicit assumption here. People putting forward this argument are implying that this time would not be well spent or that disabled children's learning and development are not worth this effort. In response to this, I would like to share the words of Judith Snow, disability rights advocate from Canada, in a piece of writing called Creating What I Know About Community. The full piece is included in, a, in the resources section of this knowledge box. And here is a short extract. When I was in high school, one of the students was an Olympic diver, a veteran with many medals. My community seemed to know just what she needed to continue to be both a gifted diver and one of our classmates. We knew that she needed access to the swimming pool at 5.30 every morning. She needed tutoring to keep up when she traveled. She needed friends, recognition, and to graduate along with us. She needed a volunteer sports club locally and various national and international organizations to maintain her opportunities to dive. Judith Snow goes on to say that a disabled student needs exactly the same sort of opportunities and structure to participate in school. But somehow, adults seemed to find it exciting to support an Olympic diver to achieve in sport and a burden to support a disabled child to attend their local school. As we approach the end of this webinar, I would like us to revisit the debate of what type of school disabled children should go to and to explain why I think that any disagreement in principle is likely to be based on a false dichotomy. The question of whether disabled children should go to their local school or a separate special school is often seen as a polarized argument which remains unresolved. Supporters of a mainstream education for all advocate this on the grounds of disabled children's right to an education without discrimination in their local community and argue that without this, prejudice and discrimination will persist. Supporters of separate special schools, on the other hand, suggest that these are needed because they offer specialized provision which is not regularly available in ordinary schools and provide a better environment for the pupils who attend them. The two positions are not mutually exclusive. The first represents a human rights position. The second, a partial reflection on existing practice. The fact remains that including disabled children in ordinary schools is a legal requirement. It is already happening in many places and the evidence suggests that it can benefit all children, disabled as well as non-disabled. At the end of the day, it makes educational, social and financial sense to plan for disabled children's learning 
in ways which do not exclude them from their local community. If we respond to children's additional needs by offering something instead of what is offered to other children, we are effectively allowing a perceived need for adult specialists to trump children's need to belong in their local community and to learn and develop alongside their non-disabled peers. That would be like putting a child in hospital without allowing family or friends to visit on the grounds that the child needs the medical intervention. At this point, I invite you one more time to reflect on what we have covered so far, review your notes from the start of this webinar, and think whether you may want to amend these in any way. Has anything changed about what you see as the main advantages of mainstream and what of separate special schools? Is there anything that you might want to change in your own practice from now on? Please take a few minutes to write down these thoughts after the end of this webinar. This is an open invitation to each and every educator to become an agent of change and play their part in removing barriers to disabled children's learning and participation. I invite each and every one of you to think about the issues covered in this webinar and consider what you can do differently from now on. This might involve helping others to see disability as an ordinary part of life, an ordinary part of being human, it might be about helping a child get a stronger sense of belonging in school, about changing the way you interact with a child or how you support their learning and development, or it might be something else altogether. If you like, you can write down your intentions alongside your other notes from this webinar and revisit them regularly. Above all, if you would like to become an agent of change, I would strongly encourage you to keep returning to your notes and your intentions, especially when you feel the force of habit luring you away from your commitment to disability equality. For now, I thank you for your attention and for engaging with these issues and leave you with the words of Peter Hick, Principal Lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University in England. In September 2019, during his presentation at the European Conference on Educational Research, he spoke of the importance of developing more inclusive schools, saying that the responsibility for changing education practice rests with each and every one of us. He kindly repeated this comment later for us to record and include here. So thanks again to Peter Hick for making this point so clearly and for allowing CSIE to share it widely. We all have our part to play in promoting more inclusive education. None of us should be paralysed by saying, it's the system, it's the funding, it's this barrier, it's that barrier. We all have some area in which we have some kind of influence. It may be uh, one student, it may be one group, it may be one classroom, it may be a school, it may be one teacher education course. Wherever we find ourselves, we can promote more inclusive education in our own centres. Thank you for your attention.